Ben and uh, Joy. Um, as a quick introduction, uh, JM Architects won the Supreme Award at the 2022 Glasgow Institute of Architects Awards dinner. Uh, and I'm very pleased to have them delivering this year's GIA annual lecture, uh, Ian Alexander and Amy McKee. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, very humbled to be here. It actually feels like part of a family because there's so many familiar faces in the audience. Um, Ex-employers, um, teachers, um, I don't know, contemporaries, people we've taught. Um, it's, actually, it's, a, yeah, it's actually my birthday this year. It's, I'm 59 at the moment, 62 weeks' time. And uh, I was talking to Amy and going, what the hell happened? You know? And then I said, how am I 60? And her, or how are you 64 or whatever it is? Stop um, that! <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not, I'm 50! <laughs> <laughs> so what I said to him was, you guys look back, there's an awful lot of things that have actually happened, so it's not as surprising, you've got kids, you've done all these projects, and uh, life rolls on, and then, I think it was Jonathan was saying earlier on, you know, you know, when you get to 60, 70, that's when you're going to be the best you're going to be, you know, it's going to be great, you can handle all the pressure, you know, you know how to make design, you can fire out the, the strategy diagrams for your clients, and uh, or being impressed and taken on board. I mean, we started this thing, I mean, I'm not a very intellectual person really. I read books, I go online, I read stuff, I read little bits of things. My wife just tells me off all the time for being too flighty, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so that, we said, said, this is not a lecture, it's like a sort of situationist sort of thing going on there. Um, but we're not here to lecture you, we're just here to do, tell you about our work, um, put it in some kind of context, um, and try and pretend there's a continuity of thought there. Because it's like a band you maybe like, you go, well, the work in the start was just the same as it was. It was the same in 56 as it was in 72. It was just a continuum of ideas. <laughs> and I think when people look back at their, their work and their lives and stuff like that, and looking forward, you think, well, either we're just messing about here, coming up with ideas on the hoof, or we're actually having a considered and thoughtful way of making things. So what we're going to do in this week's talk is get into the technical detail of how we make projects. And, you know, the office is obviously is having to adapt very, very quickly over a short period of time with climate change and everything else. And you know, we're having our four, six passive house designers in the office who are now delivering passive house schools across Scotland. So we're very, very focused on it. But I think what we're going to talk about today is just about feelings and ideas and thoughts and keep it, keep it quite down tempo and hopefully you enjoy it. We always start with these kind of things. I mean, I think for Henry and I, you know, we we kind of, I don't know what it is, I think it's a sort of form of a, a mental condition that you sort of read something when you're 23 or 24 and then you go, that's still important to us, get, get, get the book back out again, let's, let's reread it and discuss a scientific autobiography or architecture in the city and you know, you get your teachers there and you sort of, you, you kind of idolise them and everything and, and that's and your artists that you like and architects that you like and even music you play in the studio and you know, we used to put on grind, you know, and sit there designing, you know, and, thinking we were really groovy, you know, it was all, that everything was important, everything in your life was important, and that's what we've kind of always taught our students, that every kind of choice you make in life is a considered choice, and I think as architects you have, if you want to be, I think a decent architect, you have to be that way focused on stuff to actually make it, to make it happen. Um, the talk's kind of split into a number of parts, what we're going to talk about first of all, I'm going to talk about the first bit. So I do the kind of ice-breaking bit, you know, get you all warmed up. I'm the support act, really, for Mr. McCune, who's going to come on and take you away on another journey. Um, but I think what we're thinking about is that over the last 10 years, we've had a mixture of quite a lot of education projects. Um, we have won a few awards from the GIA, so we're really grateful for those awards, and uh, we don't take anything for granted. And, you know, I think what we try and do with each other is sort of develop a kind of sense of humility. And actually, that, that's within the office as well, because the office isn't just... It's not really Henry, it's, it's really people like Phil and you know, Paul, who's here as well. <laughs> so, um, Elder, for God's sake. <laughs> 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 um, so, so we're going to talk about those projects and the elements of them and how they've influenced us and how they've influenced other future projects. And I think what we're trying to see is a sense of continuity. Over the last 10 years, we haven't, we haven't kind of fallen prey to fashion in many ways. I think there's certain things where you could say, as Dick was 
say are a la mode. I always remember that word there. You know. um, but I think we're trying to keep to kind of principles of you know, layers and, and, and grain and context in place like we're always trying to do, but that's kind of one of those things. So we're going to talk through these projects and then Henry will take you through the two award winning projects from last year's awards and give you a little bit more detail on that. So I think without further ado, I'll get on with it because otherwise we'll be here all night. Yeah? Um, <laughs> The first, the first project was, was delivered back in 2014, but at the same time as Glasgow School of Art. So when Paul and his team were coming over to Glasgow, um, Craig and I were trying to de de deliver this project, and we'd all kind of worked on it in little bits. So there was always a, a feeling that different people worked in different bits. You know, somebody developed the screens, somebody developed the sections, somebody developed the elevations. There was a whole kind of interwoven aspect to delivering projects in the office. And the project had been the site of an old Indian restaurant which had been there for years and when I was a kid it was a great Indian restaurant there. Mm -hmm. then it fell down and then it became a car park and it lay there for, but, but the condition, the urban condition was very interesting because it, it mediated between the city and the park at the back and it was a whole idea about how you can make a roof work and how you can change level and I actually find that drawn at the bottom looks nothing like the actual building because it was, it was a very very early sketch I think for an interview <coughs> that we did but Henry wanted to say mentioned the fact that drawing to us is, is very important, that manual drawing is very important. And even in the age of you know digital technology and skill, we still think that's important as well. So we're trying to encourage folk to draw in, in the office. Simple little section, primary school with um, a nursery at one end. This was a, a rational, the funny story behind this, this was a rationalisation project for the city council. <coughs> we were going to shut three schools and open up this, this little head primary school because everyone got to a point in the West End where they had their kids then they got off to Bears Den. Sorry, Russell. Um, <laughs> and that was the way life was. And then the crash happened about 2009, I think it was, or eight, nine, and, and no one moved out of the neighbourhood. And all of a sudden, we moved into the school from day one and it was absolutely packed. So, you know, it's been there for a number of years and it's, I think it's one of our most sort of successful things. You know, it's the <coughs> idea, you know, having a building in front, a building in the back, on the side, and connecting with a bridge. I mean, we do this with a bridge and put it across a hole in the site because there's a weak copy you've got to go down. And we thought, we'll never get away with this. You know, and the next minute it's in the drawings, it's in the bills, it's getting built on site. And he pressed it because it's quite interesting to done that thing. Edinburgh Garden is near, um, it's down near Gurban. Is it on the edge of Gurban? It's on the edge of Gurban. And I think there was a kind of an idea here that developed a deep plan project and actually having to bring the light into the centre of the plan. There's little courtyards which usually in projects get chopped out because of money and finance and a whole bunch of other reasons. So that's a little quick thing there. Yeah. And we thought it was important to have some kind of public interface. The, the public interface was kind of subtle, but kind of knew what the front and the back was, and that walls wrapped around the outer perimeter to protect the kids. It's in the SN school, so it was very important protection, protection lines of people being in, being dropped off. There's a whole layer of sensibility as they built into the design. Um, but we also wanted to have a presence and, and be a wee bit of a landmark in the neighbourhood. And so we developed drawings which highlighted from a datum of an ease where the high spaces might be within that. And the idea of having wide corridors and moving around and flow of the space was very, very important. So we're sort of picking up things, ideas here that absolutely informed later projects like Collywood. So I think it's important to hold that, hold that for it. And the idea of light as a material that in effect we could you know, make a little painting of an idea and then have a sensory tool which went from a daytime condition to a nighttime condition. And then a corridor which is marked by a, a ribbon of colour as, as you went along the corridor with the colours would go over your head and you go through the colours and you thought there was a sort of interactive process there which might be slightly kind of engaging for children that actually attend the school. You know, I think material palette's important, we're getting the right brick. The, the width of timbers, you know, things like this, we're kind of obsessed with the width of things and things don't look too fat and then they're not, they're thin and look detailed and if we get a chance to make a little sign, somebody will design a little sign and cast it into the, into the wall. So every, every little moment there's a little bit of poetry, a little bit of kind of engagement with the project as well. In 2012, Phil, what was the date? 2013 we started. 2013 we started. You got a look of a life sentence on you. <laughs> <laughs> so Phil, Phil actually ran this project and he did an excellent job of designing it and taking it on site. 
and there's some beautiful spaces in it. There's a really, really nice primary school in there, and ASN and secondary school, and it's a, it's a quite a nice project. It was between um, called Burnley and Garnock, yeah. and it makes a new centre between these two towns. So it's got quite a kind of I feel like owner's role to actually perform and be a bit of a civic centre as well. It's a huge big swimming pool in it, and um, the swimming pool was like specced to the tunnels, and for some reason it was here or here, but they didn't they didn't build the project. So, but what but what happened was that. They, they built it. They built this amazing school with really good spec, and I guess I had a civic role. You know, I had a civic role. You know, I gave the entrance and the, the threshold was very, very important. The scale could be seen from a distance was important as well. Um, internal spaces had to be flexible and collaborative. And things like the library and, and the, the sixth form breakout space all opened on onto this big space here. So, you know, it's, it's a big space with a lot of people in it. It's a bit like a foyer Queen Street station or something. You know. But it, it kind of works and it, and it opens things up and breaks down that kind of whole idea of going to a building to a small reception area and then darting off in a corridor to your room. And, and it was definitely not to do that. And it's also to provide little sheltered spaces outside where kids can have their lunch. And there's overhangs and there's depth to things that you can go underneath. And I think, you know, we think that architecture needs that. It needs layering. It needs incidents and moments that provide the light. And I think also kind of allow you to identify your way through a big building with these little moments and little signifiers, you know, so this obsession with the stair and the joint of the stair. And I think it's fair to say that this happened at a time when we were working in the art school, we were working with someone who uses concrete and tries to mould con concrete to create flow and space and define character. So I think we picked up on that and I think working for Stephen, notwithstanding our experience with other in Canada, um, it, it was like going back to school again, you know, it was really just going back to school. We, we learned a lot with Tom and Dick. I mean, we learned so much about making plans and detail and buildings. And we genuinely wouldn't be here doing what we're doing without, without that input um, and that education. And, and when Stephen came across as well, it was like a different voice from a different country. And it was just interesting to get a perspective on it. But, that, but at the end of the day, the guy didn't work too much differently from the way um, that we'd work ourselves. This is another, another move towards a rural site in Kilpatrick, and it's an ESN school again. And the idea of bringing dignity through architecture to a place and to people was very, very much upon us. And people like, you know, Jakobsen, I think there are strong references here, the idea of sort of minimal Nordic influences in architecture, and how can you make a feeling of place? And I maintain that when you make take a photograph of a building, it's very telling what you photograph. You know, so where things recede. So, in terms of environment, that idea of not actually sort of overdeveloping space, of a respectful tree canopy, and other bits around the site are all really important. And we felt that we were holding on to all those elements. So, very much now, and it started with a, it started a few years ago with a, a first phase of a, a housing project we did in Bob Shields. That you know we looked at the site and it was just covered in trees, and we thought we can't take these down. We have to carefully build the buildings around the trees, and, and it's the same with Paul Patrick. That idea of, um, what's that, um, we get banjo like feed into you, that track, you know, where, where you've got one thing feeds into another, so you get basically a connected landscape, so you get this like a little campus here, so you get the, the trees that are already there, and you get the new trees, and the implanted trees, and they kind of merge together. So for us that was really important, that landscape interrupts the architecture and creates a completely different situation from what was there before. Um, and as we worked with Randy Fraser on this developmental landscaping idea, so thank you to them. Again, like in Bergarvan, the idea of the flow of the plan was important, views outside at all points, having single loaded corridors, not double loaded corridors, to, to encourage natural light. And this is very early on now, this is all plots and grass, grasses and really good, good kind of environmental projects all perform in these outdoor spaces, so it's a much, much richer environment than shown in these photographs. And then the idea of harmony, the idea of stepping back and presence within the landscape as well, and and using mounds, you know, using natural topography of the land to receive the building into the landscape, I think, is, is important to us, that the, the architecture is not just landing, and then you've got 150 from the DPC down to the ground level. It's about having a right good look, you know, and before we know where we are, either Phil or Henry will get to the site and photograph every little detail, cobblestones, the whole nine yards, and come back. It's, 
it's like a photographic essay in its own, its own right, and that leads to then the first views on the site and first observations, which you're trying to be not just unique for the sake of being unique, but also to try and answer the client's question and that kind of stuff. James Glenn Wesley's campus was delivered about the mid sort of late 2017, and it was the challenge of building a large secondary school, which had already been in the site within an existing site in a live environment next to a castle and then having to deal with all the having to deal with this terrible having to negotiate with all the neighbours who lived round about, you know. <laughs> who were all very articulate in in burgers, you know, and they would have you'd have these um, meetings like a, like a consultation meeting in the school. The place would be packed. You'd be like hundred two hundred folk there. A bit like I am doing tonight, you would, you would turn up sort of quaking in your boots, you know, and <laughs> lots of questions that were difficult to answer. So it was challenging to do the scales and context. And it's a campus building, it's, it's a campus of buildings, it's not one, one building. Um, so that's the corner of the building there in Edinburgh. Um, and the scale, of the, uh, the scale of the building was determined by tenemental scale and about, and it, it fluctuates up and down with a little art there. Um, but again, a fairly rational plan, single loaded classrooms, again, quite difficult to do in secondary school with budgets nowadays, but with, with embedded courtyards, um, which you can kind of see in this plan here, so these little green, these little spaces with the buckets. Is that the top? I don't know. I don't want to tell these in anyone, though. courtyards, which can invent like the plan. These are single story elements, which provide localised back then for the students. And these are all the same little classrooms. The little entrance pavilion here. There's a sort of games and music venue here. And then there's um, this is a sports building. So the sports building picks up on Wander Park Road here. Um, there's a Lauderdale Street with a big long facade. No doors. Come on. What? No doors. No doors? Keep going. <laughs> he's, rushing me, he's rushing me along here. He's going to be sleeping by the time he comes down. But, um, and then crafting the facade, and I remember going to the planners and the planners sort of talking about quality and saying, how are you going to deliver quality in a um, conservation area? I said, well, if you, and I remember this from way back, that from a previous planning application, we drew all the elevators to 1 to 50 and put them into the planning application, and rubber stamp, and it helped to preserve I mean, the quality, but then we just have to take the landscape architect, so we're working with Chris at Ryan Fraser and we bought into the whole idea as well, and that all became part of the planning application. So I think it was to do with the location that really helped to safeguard the architecture. Um, and, you know, the idea of courtyards that are open to the air where students can put projects in, and they're related to art rooms and technical rooms and things as well, and little semi-covered spaces, tempered environments, and then the little collaborations, or big collaboration spaces that start within um, that whole building. And a lot of it was done just by collaborating with the client, and a lot of a guy called Keith Thompson from Edinburgh City Council. Keith was very, very proactive and brought in people like Maggie Barlow, Space, Space Solutions, to come in and help sort of engage with the, the school population. So, a complex project, but I think at the end of the day it was, it was trying to do something different than that. Really. Um, this project, I wasn't really involved in this very, very much, you know, apart from sort of maybe they say, I don't like this, I don't like that. It's really nice. Mm -hmm. and, and Craig and other folk were involved. But what I do like about it is that it carries on that, I think, that language of um, Jakobsen and that sort of, sort of kind of cool Nordic kind of thing. And again, it won a few awards as well. And it was, so I think, in many ways, for us, there's that kind of idea of the imprints of these education buildings that have all led up to um, the, the projects from last year. And what's interesting as well is that all different groups have worked on these projects, different architects, you know, and they're all in other practices now. And it's nice to think that the, the office, I mean, I forgot to mention this, Henry, the, the office is like an atelier, mm -hmm. and that was based on the whole idea of the people come in and can contribute and kind of be taught, and the leaders in the office can be taught by the people who are being taught, and we felt that was a very, very important way. So there's no hierarchy in the office, I mean, he does the dishes, mm -hmm. I pretend to do the dishes, mm -hmm. I'll wash one <laughs> cup, and uh, there's a kind of, we kind of do these things purpose, purposefully to try and bring people in and engage with them and make them feel part of the team. So this is the big, um, this is a courtyard building, and it's based around an old school that was on the site, and it forms a courtyard of the old school, mm -hmm. and it makes a venal, um, the venal being a local characteristic of the town of Ailith that was transplanted into a project. 
the things that lead to the main hall signifies at the end and the passions. You know, I think little details of this. I mean, this comes from a. Um, I mean, that comes from an obsession with Tsujima and how Tsujima brings glass up to a roof and makes the foliage really thin. So I think within these projects, are really, in some ways they are gestural. They're very much based on a knowledge of how you might put things together as well. And I think the chance we're having now with, with a lot of our projects is how can we deal with fitness in terms of um, sustainability and insulation levels being up. We had a talk last week about insulation levels and I've just realised I can't even insulate the loft anymore because there'll be no room for me to go inside the loft once I put the insulation in. Mm -hmm. So there's all these challenges for, for architects that I think are um, very real and I think it's spinning all those plates at the one time so you can sort of take the painting and solve the detail, so, so to speak. The little plan at the top, you can see up there, there's, there's the old school, the old content, the old school there. And here's the vinyl down the side and the school just wrapped around the hall here. And again, so all these little dining facilities are in this, this little wing here as well. You see this from a route off site, so it encourages you to come in and around and into the front door and into the venue. Um, but again, I think we're trying, I think it's to do with practicality, but I think also sort of getting your ideas in early with the client and actually the clients really um, enshrining these things like with the projects and generosity and light and the very good details that we can bring like above them. Um, and I think we've just been very fortunate, you know, so. Henry, that we've managed to have those opportunities and exploit them within the projects and, and, and keep on doing that. So, and I think the thing about it is, it's a bit like building up a head of steam. It's a bit like once you've done it a few times, you, you, you go into meetings with people and you kind of you propose things that maybe if you were less experienced, you might not. So I think my kind of advice to younger architects is to go for it and, and sort of really promote your thoughts and, and if you get conviction behind you. Sometimes it doesn't work, but sometimes the clients can be convinced by your <coughs> conviction and go. Let's, let, let's give it a go. Um, I put this in for just good measure. Really. They're not really education buildings, they're visitor centres, but they have an educational role in society. And they sit within um, incredibly beautiful spaces. You know, like kind of look for Martin as a client. And kind of treat the visitor centre, which is the dark skies, Halloween, Halloween Park. And there's a whole idea here about really about not showing the building off. It was like, when I was younger, in 83, I came back up from London and the borough was being built and went to the borough and the borough was built against a, a forest wall. And in many ways we did the same thing here. We kind of built the building against the forest wall and we coloured it in black so you can't even really see it very well. Um, but it's got big views across to Cairnsmore, which is a big hill. So, and then up the back there's a, there's a cycle trail and there's a cycle shop and a so you can change your clothes and get a shower and stuff. And a big field in front. So it's, it's quite a dramatic kind of um, location. Um, and we ended up doing I think five visitor centres for forestry commission. A lot of them were just like fit, you know, adapt and mend and fix the toilets and stuff like that. But we had two, this one and the lodge at Aberfoyle we did some work too and actually sort of did the interior store as well. So I think they've been very influential projects in the office. I think they've taught us about detailing and um, they've taught us about you, in small buildings you can actually promote a lot of, I don't think how I'll word this, but you know, you can actually get things like your your thermal tubes into the ground and stuff. I think we get five boreholes here, and um, so it's a pretty much a not good solution. Yeah, it's got some electricity from the mains. Um, it's got a car gesture, stuff like that. So it was built from the point of view that they wanted to be as kind of environmentally, you know, clean as possible. And I think it was a, it was a good learning curve work for us working with environmental engineers and trying to sort of promote that. And then that's some of the knowledge from this project has migrated into other projects as well. Um, the body and the turret kind of look is fairly recent um, and it sits in two parts. It's, it, this project was really, really um, Martin's kind of brainchild in many ways. He had looked at the whole site of kind of loop and thought about all the interventions that could possibly happen and how they could promote inclusivity and participation and encourage people to go to outdoor spaces. And Martin, it was actually a very, very, you were ahead of your time because when you think about what, what happened about two years later with um, COVID and everything, and, and the place becomes a living room for the, for the East End. So it was a kind of a whole new engagement of how you might use landscape. So what we did strategically was, and I remember going to see Martin going, Martin, we're not going to build the bothy and the tur like that, do a bothy and do a tur joined on like a church. We're going to basically place them in two separate parts of the park. And part of that was, I thought, well, 
if you split them in two, you get more, you get more bang for your buck by doing that, you know, and uh, you can actually get an intervention down at one end where you enter across the big bridge from the game's village, and then another bit which is much more subtle and near the entrance into the park. So I love this photograph because you can't really see the body, but you see, you see its shadow. It's like a ninja project for me, you know? <laughs> yes, I mean, it's like you see it down here, you know, you see it up there, and I think that's kind of, kind of interesting. And I, I guess that comes from the crib tree thing as well. And then the idea that, you know, in the, as the seasons change, you know, things become hidden, architecture becomes hidden, um, and it's not necessarily a certa. I love this photograph of that wee dog. It's just mm. amazing. It's like wee daddy walking around there. He looks, does look very happy. And, you know, the, the colour of the trees and stuff like that. So again, that kind of celebration of nature, that kind of, you know, letting the architecture just be a little bit plain, step back a little bit, and then um, promote nature and, and the place and the context. And then onto the, the tower itself. And way, way back in the day, I never thought about this before, but Penny and I were obsessed with a project called the Asaka Follies, which happened in Japan. And people like Kuhas, Peter Wilson, Eduk, Zaha, all built these pavilions for a garden festival. And I think subconsciously we've been waiting for a moment where we could build a, a sack of folly. Thank you, Martin. Yes, <laughs> again. He's going to be he's gonna be walking out your list tonight. Um, but, uh, and it kind of happened, and, and things like, you know, there's the, the stratification of the East End timbers on top of the big chunky timbers and stuff, and we had to kind of learn about, about timber engineering doing this project, working with timber designers and stuff as well. There was there was the choice to do this in steel, actually, you know, and we felt that we had to get as much, you know, we had to sort of drive steel out the project. That was a that was a kind of you know, modus operandi, but it didn't mean that you had to deal with chunkiness and thickness and maybe a lack of slenderness in places. And so that was a, that was an education. So there you are, you're, you're in your mid fifties and you're still learning. And then delivering the thing on site, you must have a heart attack doing it as well. But that's, that's just life, isn't it? That's just being an architect, you know. Um, the nice thing about this project was that the client wanted it to be, you know, access for wheelchair users and people who are infirm or push chairs or Skateboarders, mm -hmm. magic big long ramp that goes right through the tree. You know, it, 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 it works because it kind of gets you up there within the increments and you have to get up there, but it also has a sort of degree of, as uh, you say, it's a tree walk really, isn't it? It's a tree walk and things are implanted back into it again. And then the crown on top, there's a little, there's a little lookout post there, but that was really to try and get a presence in the landscape and, you know, so you could see it from Celtic Park. So, you know, <laughs> So I'm going to hand over to Henry, so I'm not going to hog the whole show here and uh, so you take over and uh, do your thing. Uh, that's, that's the clicker. <laughs> you, just, you just press that button and you do that. Which one? This is the state we've got ourselves into. Just keep your eyes. That one for going forward. That one. Um, right, so when Tom Elder and Dick Cameron turned up tonight, I freaked, it freaked me out because, uh, like Ian was saying, when you get your mentors in the room, you, you have to watch what they say because <laughs> because they might think they're bullshitting. Um, so, so now that they're here, I'm freaked out. Anyway, <laughs> a couple of wee things. Um, GIA, I think for Ian and I, Elder and Karen, John Alexander, JM, you've been great sponsors. You've been fantastic um, advocates of looking at our work critically and, 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 and giving us acknowledgement. And for that, we're very, very um, grateful. Also, for, for Iz and Phil getting their medals tonight, dead chuffed. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for that. Are you all puffed out? How long have you got? in your heads, but 10, 15 minutes? Two hours. Two hours. Two hours. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, what, what, what I, my, my bit is to talk about the wee projects that we got um, uh, awards for last year. Uh, we, got, we got an award for a series of nursery schools for um, East Renfrewshire Council, early years sc schools, and one for a, a primary school in a kind of wilderness out in uh, West Lothian, Calderwood. So this wee project, well, this wee project is, is basically five projects rolled into one. Um, we were asked to look at uh, a template building that would serve early years across the East Renfrewshire Council's campus. And after like 
you know, distilling all the kind of different sites that they've chosen into five sites, we were asked to look at a footprint that could be replicated on each. But as architecture goes, and as client goes, it's five different buildings. And the, the good thing was we had one contractor. So these be these be oh going the wrong way. You told me you told me the wrong button. You told me the wrong button. It's a bottom button. It's a bottom one. Everyone knows that, Henry. So there you go. So these are the five locations, and um, we started off. John McDonald's here. Where is he? There he is. Another pivotal person in this project, and another spooky audience member to me. Because I can't, I can't talk any shit. <laughs> but anyway, we were given these four sites, five sites, and, and, and they're all they're all in kind of like a rural, kind of um, built up, vernacular, how do you call it, kind of quasi-residential circumstance. Not quite out of town. Not quite in town, not urban, not completely residential, but they all had a characteristic, which is that they all had trees and landscape and stuff that um, around them that adds to the idea of how you think about early years and the idea of children being able to learn outside a building um, and be part of an external environment. That is that the building doesn't, doesn't interfere with. So our kind of mantra really was, how do we create something that that, that negotiates between uh, a secure, environmentally you know, sound building, but the idea that you can just work, branch out and and as we we called it, have room to roam and learn. Mm -hmm. So we, each of these sites. Um, had similar characteristics. Now, one of the things that we kind of always try to look for are like principles that might inform what you do. Even if it's the, in the most modest way, how could you, for example, create a building that is an interface between inside and outside and, 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 and kind of um, embraces nature? The idea that the, the building in its place even though it's maybe very, very discreet, is not dominant and 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 and, and over over dom you know or, what's the word like kind of overstriding, and the idea that that when you're in the building or you're out of the building, uh, every at each in each location, you feel as though you're either in one place or the other at the same time. And, and, that, and that also incorporates the idea of what you see outside the building. So the idea that the building is not an elevation, it's not a composition of windows, it's a place to be in from which you can look out, in, out to and see something that is important. Then the kind of idea of like materiality, just making sure that you can build something that's going to stay up, it's going to keep the, the weather out, it's going to be sustainable, um, but it's not looking for a lot of um, variation. So there's maybe like a consistency of how you choose what the building is made from. The idea inside the building of flow, the idea of circulation being um, on filad, is absolutely paramount in all the schools or education projects. From this idea that there's no corridor er, anywhere, anywhere, any of these buildings. There's no corridor. So one space overlaps with the other and, and kids can see other kids learning. They can feed off each other. They can learn to graduate between one year and the next. Absolutely paramount. And you get a client that buys into that because a lot of a lot of the issues around about early years is about to get the care commission and all these very, very stringent regulations. But actually when you break them down they're not that stringent, actually. So the idea of then of FF and E, the idea of how you fit the thing out, um, how you make the interior feel as though it's part of the overall project and not just a add-on where someone comes in and goes, well, we'll just pack all the stuff into it and it'll be colourful, it'll be pink and blue and 
So the idea that you, you can try and control that is very important. And then the idea of scale. And I don't have any, we don't have any issue of a wee small kid being in a big tall space. Don't have an issue because you could live in a big house and be in that circumstance. So the notion of scale and this, uh, this idea that, you know, at early years it's got to be for wee kids doesn't make any sense to us. Anyway, the key, the key, the key, this, this is Glenwood, this is the bigger of the five buildings. Um, and the wee image on the left hand side as I look at it um, is as you come into the building and the kind of plan, we don't want to do plans and all that kind of stuff, but the idea of each of these buildings is that there are four or five layers from the point of entry, if you like, to the point of exit. And there are also layers of exit from each end of the building so that these wee kids who come in, the parents, the first thing to see is that view right through from the front door to the back. Yeah, in this case, it's through this courtyard here, which is open. Yeah, yeah. in courtyard out, and that's the image. So this idea of being able to um, create a plan and an idea that is all about what you see um, and what you witness as a user. They're absolutely critical. Um, I'm not going to labour it, but we, we, we referenced Glen Market in this new project. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Were you obsessed with Glen, Glen Market? So no, just the idea. <laughs> before <just> you <laughs> shake this mortal coil, you're going to go, I'm going to get a. I'm no, no, I think it was, more the, it was more, it wasn't so much the idea that you, you, you're, you're looking at another architect's work and you're going to all do that. These were all like pavilions. They're all like kind of. Um, small, low, skilled um, ground scrapers, if you like, that just needed a very, very subtle approach. And we just thought that the idea of a profile, um, which is quite exaggerated, would give us natural ventilation, top light, and internally a form that would inform the open plan below. Um, so this wee slide sort of demonstrates the second layer of that first image where you're you're under shelter but you're still just outside the building and then you're out yeah and that's a wee transition space between outside inside and outside so this idea of these layers we're, we were very lucky we had a client who, who kind of bought into it um, another idea was the idea integration to landscape and this notion of, of trying to make trying to figure out a building that form that you know was kind of in the background um, and that the trees and the landscape around the, the sites would prevail and then this notion of very simple detail and continuity of the consistent language of de details material no fuss just a, sim a simple, simple thing. And the idea of openness, so the whole, every one of the buildings is a big, big pavilion structure. It's a big portal frame, which is defined by this roof, uh, which is top lit. And it, it's just this, so as you go, go across the plan as well as going through it, as you go through the plan, it's, it's a graduation between one-year-olds, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, up to the point where you leave. And there's this kind of idea that you can roam around and feel as if you're in a very, very comfortable place. And it's very flexible. There's loads and loads of wee things that you can do that allow you to close things off. A lot of the, I won't go into detail, but a lot of the buildings got changed into um, community facilities, like changing rooms for football teams and parts of the building and how they get used in different ways from the early years. But anyway, that's not the point of the conversation. The point of the conversation really is the idea of trying to create this kind of like environment that, that a young young person will maybe remember, will enjoy being able to have the freedom to move in from inside to outside and always be secure. So these are we just we snaps of, of 
the sort of that's the sort of semi outside space. So you see a screen, another screen, and then you're outside. But that's not heated. That space. So you have these wee wee moments where the wee kids don't have to get um, all dressed up in big puffy jackets and stuff. But they do get cold. Mm -hmm. Able to feel the difference in temperature. Um, and they learn. So that's that we see the project. Calderwood was the project that you give us a supreme award for. So this is a primary school in um, West Lothian. It was one of two projects we got in the same commission. And there are in these situations in West Lothian where there's no environment, there's no context. It's a big, big, big open field. And a kind of, you know, kind of master plan that is just coloured in blocked. But the point here was that the, that, that the council and the developer needed to have the school built first. <laughs> so that's quite an odd thing, you know, <laughs> trying to, anyway. So again, just taking those wee principles and taking those wee um, values that we talked about earlier in the early years, most of them still apply. And working through a process of how you maybe define place and begin to you know make these booklets up, you know, those design access statements you make up, which are mostly mostly crap. Truthfully, truthfully. They're just, you know, filling up pages of stuff that doesn't really mean anything. Um, because when it comes right down to it, it's just about well, is the building any good and is it gonna be a good thing to go to and be in and does it relate well to this landscape. So imagine you're asked <laughs> to build there. That's a, nothing. nothing. Um, and, and, and there's no kids, there's no there's no um, no there's no primary school that's closing down that the kids are gonna move from. So there's no teachers, there's no headmaster or headmistress. Um, just this kind of idea that there's this big commercial residential thing happening and you have to build a building to face on to, in this case, a public square. So we went back to our principles of <coughs> this idea of likeness and we're, we're very open about using other people's work to reference and look at things and but not just to do it as eye candy or, or, or kind of just for a gimmick but to really, really, really choose it carefully so that when we're talking to our clients or we're talking to our parents, these things mean something. So the idea of light and openness and ambience, arrival are all really important. The idea of views again, flexible space, the idea of welcoming, the idea of courtyard maybe, if you get away with it. And then just going through the, the process, I mean, uh, uh, I see he is he's here and Clara's here and, you know, and <laughs> There's a lot of people here who do schools and it, they're tedious things to do sometimes and you just go through the motions. But there was a good process here of developing a kind of idea that, about, um, for a council who had never done, if you like that, not an open plan school, but a, a school where there were no barriers between spaces, between rooms and between years. And that became very, very, very important to us. And they work their way through a whole bunch of diagrams and stuff and adjacencies and I hate these words, I hate them. <laughs> I can hate them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really, no, honestly, it's, it, it, I do because, what does that mean? What do we use it, what, why do we use these terms when it's about a wee kid coming to school, walking in the front door, and what's in front of them? Now, when I was at school, my experience is completely different, but I remember, if I, I could draw a plan of my primary school, and it was 200 years old, and I could draw a plan of it, because that's what it does to you. It, it kind of embeds itself in your memory. So I hate these words, but anyway, you have to do them, so that you can see our one thing might go against another or be beside something. Um, and then working with teachers and, and, and a good, really good client here, looking at 
this idea of a three-sided three cl classroom. Not, not unique, not, not novel, not, you know, but, but this notion that um, you could create an, at an atmosphere and a, and a series of spaces that when you pass them, we bit like an airport, you know, when you go past all the departure lounges and big American airports, it's just all open and they have a name. And they don't have to have a name to anywhere, you can change the name. So you don't have to have <coughs> P1, P2, P3. You just have to have a space where you can learn. Anyway, so an awful lot of work going through all of that. But I'm, I'm conscious that time's moving on. And this is the idea that this wee building had to have this kind of um, other agenda, which was it had to sit there like a, a building that was there, that was going to form a public space, like a school being like a town hall or something. It's Bonkers, absolutely bonkers. Um, anyway, that's that's what they're given. That's what we have to work with. So this notion that the wee building has to all also resemble a kind of a, a kind of more important public building than maybe it should be, I think is a strange, strange thing to, have to ask. Anyway, so that's part of the agenda. And then this idea of how do you when we're all doing our work, we all do 3Ds, we all do CGIs, we all do, yeah? But how do you really do them? Like, you do 25 of them and choose two to show people. So you're walking around the building and you're designing. And, and, and genuinely, we do produce hundreds of these things to try to find a way of making sure that the ones we choose to show the client and the parents really do try and communicate. Now, I'm not saying these are the be or end all, they're very basic, but but they also replicate the principles that we were talking about. I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> anyway, that's the kind of, that's the final outcome of the be building. Just walking around it. It's kind of when you come in the front door, that's the first thing you see, that big staircase. So that, I'm not going through the plan, but this idea that um, you know everybody does it, everybody does it, yeah. Mm -hmm. So not you, but it's where you put it, and and, and 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 how it works. So that serves as the uh, main circulation space, the first floor, and library. And then inside there, there's room to room, loads and loads of open space, just loads of un on kind of defined ways of walking about the building. And nobody nobody cares. There's a door in a room, the teacher owns it. No one cares. And it's a lovely wee thing to go into. And kids just well I, I think well, they're told they love it. And that's it. Thank you. I was ask you, you, you didn't mention them, but I wondered whether Aldo Van Eyck and Hertzberger had sort of influenced your school work. I think, I think in terms of the idea of you know, creating repeatable systems, I think, that's, I think that's really interesting. But I think when what we find when we're making schools is that very often we're creating hybrid solutions. You know, they're, they're not as pure, perhaps, as the, as the as, as those examples by Hertzberger and Van Eyck. Yeah, and that kind of idea of sort of structural structuralism because the construction systems we work with are, are very often hybrid. You know, we might be using a timber frame and then move into something else and, and to do with sometimes to do with budget, sometimes to do with a whole bunch of reasons. But I think spatially definitely I mean I, one thing that's really caught my mind recently is um like Central Be Here. Um and it's interesting it's coming back in a conversation back up at the school where we teach because we're talking about the idea of, of repeatable elements. So I think within our practice, to tell you the truth, I think, I think we've probably got no, to go I, forward, you know? I, there's, 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 they don't really come into the conversation, Robin, but the idea of openness, the idea of overlooking, the idea of volume, and, you know, if you, get a, if you can do a section, you're lucky. 
but this notion of you know the Hertzberger um, approach, which is beautiful. I mean, come on, it's beautiful. You're lucky if you get. Oh, I don't know. You're lucky if you, you know, get half of that. But so the answer is it's not really a big influence, but the approach and attitude is about that. But interesting that the way that the school education design is going, as Henry was saying, it's all about open spaces and, and collaborative spaces. You could see something like Central be here becoming a school. You know, it could adapt quite easily with with fit out and furniture and stuff to be that. So I think we, we live in very interesting times for, for education and the way it's in, in direction it's going with technology as well. And I think it could be you know, there's, there's there's I think steps to be made to, to move the whole agenda forward. You know, that the classroom's starting to dissolve for the most. Well I think yeah. as well, I mean Maybe it's not politically correct, but I think I think the way procurement and briefing is going, and costs are going, the, the ability for an architect to do anything that is in any way interesting is becoming much, 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 much more limited. Um, well, big time limited to the point where if you were practicing down in England not building a public school. You'd be using porta cabins stacked on each other. You know, on a court. Mm. That that would be it. That's what we can afford to build. So I, I think so far we've been lucky a wee bit. We've got away with a few things. But I think it has been to do with clients, Henry. I think holding back projects, to not not going out to contractors until after stage th three. You know, our idea stage three at the least, and some of the earlier ones without even later, you know, um, and the, not the danger, but the kind of, the difficulty is that there are, I know a lot of schools are being built with contractors in at concept stage, and that becomes a little bit more of a challenge. It's completely stifles the whole, yeah. I mean, if we're preaching that the converter didn't want to turn this into a, a whinging match, but, you know, <laughs> no, no, but seriously, I mean, we've, we've been lucky to do a couple of the things that we're showing you here tonight, that hopefully have a bit of content and a bit of quality but it's not been it's not been an easy journey <laughs> to, to get there. Yeah. It's, I think it's very interesting I think I think I put it as a, as a photo to, sh to share the, the, the pressures of the job and the challenges of the job and swap ideas and if you look at um, Sea Hill Heads Primary School when we did that Henry that was like almost like the olden days it was here's the brief here's your engineer your QS go away and do a design take it up we're going to tender it will go out and so city, city building David McCune ended up getting the project and then David McCune, I think we shot ourselves in the foot, David McCune then took a lot of the projects, the primary school projects in house, Gareth did one up in the West End, we did that one at Hillhead and then they, they built up a in house team, I think um, Liam from Hoskins mm -hmm. went in there and then they started doing all their own primary school so it was quite an interesting thing but, but that was a kind of almost a unique way and I think actually even today Glasgow City Council's primary schools are, are pretty interesting. Yeah, pretty good. They're interesting yeah. projects and there's one up in not far from Cunningham Loop as well, which is it's a decent building. Yeah. It's a decent building. So it's, it's st I, I mean I don't know how that mixed mode of procurement's gonna go, whether you're gonna get a two a two stream thing and there'll be opportunities for architects to be more connected to clients and create new things and with with driven clients who have got agendas you know, like West Lothian definitely got an agenda about really making their mark. Young clients, um, project managers, QSs, um, but really wanting to do good work, you know, and I think they're, they're, they're unusual, but I think as architects we have to recognise these unusual people and make good work. So. But I think we all share this, same, we all share the same challenges, you know, it's uh, difficult sometimes. One, one question, how do you feel the sustainable agenda will affect, or is it already affecting your work? Yes, it is. I mean, I'm, I'm, a lot of the, schools, the new schools are now passive house schools, you know, mm -hmm. so we're having to deal with that. And, you know, with passive house as well, there's issues, well, not issues, but there's challenges of um, orientation, mm -hmm. you know, fenestration, and um, things that are sealed, you know. So there's a, there's a whole different site, the amount of windows, the amount of fenestration you get in the building. Mm -hmm. um, you were mentioning about the, the, the little moments, and sometimes I find. Uh, it's another constraint put on, on the jobs, you know, when you have to think so much about, you know, there's only one orientation, there's only a, a proportional window, there's yeah. only, you know, like, limit the amount of wall to 
you're, 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 you're reminding me of, of Mr. Cannon, mm -hmm. who, when we were, and Mr. Elder, when you were at Elder and Cannon, not taking anything as read because someone said it was. Mm -hmm. So, when we're doing a project out at Ardrossan where we were told, before we'd hardly drawn anything, that the form factor was all wrong. <laughs> yeah, yes. so, like we always do, and Dick, Tom, don't take this like patronising. I'd say to Ian, what would Dick do? He'd go, I'm going to fucking learn about passive house and form factor. I'm going to learn more than the people who are telling me what this is all about. And we did. And we maintained the form of a building that's curvilinear. That's not this box. That so, I'm not saying we're geniuses or anything, but all we did was challenge the idea of the logic of what you've been told would work. And not enough to know, okay, well let's extend that, lo that knowledge, that rationale, and tell us why, you know, under the circumstances you've told us, yeah. this doesn't work. And I'm, I'm going to maintain the footprint. We're doing a, a passive house school up north in Peterhead, <coughs> and working with Scandinavian architects. It's a bit like Stephen Hall thing, you know? So they go away and draw the plan of the school, and they bring it back, and it's all arms and legs. It's like somebody's... <laughs> <laughs> it's all over. I'm thinking, what, you know, we've drummed into form factors, like, mm, you know, yeah, one, yeah. Of, one of those. <laughs> and <laughs> work on how they make it work. But they've, they've eventually made it work, you know? And they've driven a kind of agenda of internal spatial relationships to external spaces, and it's a timber frame building, and it's got all the good things in it as well good energy system, all that type of thing, you know, low <coughs> carbon agenda. And, and we seem to have turned a corner, but they went through a process where they, were, they weren't really believed, you know, they were, people were very simple, there was con not contractors involved from early on, but PMs who were driving the project were a wee bit kind of, you know. I'd be saying young architects, it's query everything's testing things. You know. no, don't make yourself into a test or an irritation, but question it and yeah. learn it. Yeah. Learn it so that when you go to meetings and you're presenting things in front of the clients, you're as credible as the M and E person or some you know, guy that's got a girl that's got a pacifist accreditation because they've sat in a classroom for two months doing sums about solar gain and insulation. It's not rocket science. But I think if you're an architect and you're lazy, then you'll let these people walk all over you. And if you are serious about what you're trying to achieve, and you are serious about not being argumentative in a pest. Learn your trade, and, and, and be careful. But and and uh, 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 and, and, and clients will take the word of some boffin before you take your word. Yeah. It's always a it always aware of it. <laughs> so how do you sit in a meeting and not necessarily outgun the, the boffin, but okay, right, well, how do you measure that journey of learning and understanding and asking the right questions and getting proof and testing that proof and anyway. I, 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 I think I think I think young 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 <coughs> generation architects are up against it big time. Unless they're prepared to, you know, just push, push for a, you know, push on and think. We're well-trained people, you know, we're pretty skilled people, technically and creatively, and I think. I think as well when new rules come in, I think I think we're quite a kind of um, traditional. I don't mean conservative, traditional profession. You know, we enter a kind of comfort zones and we're working with the things we know so we, we get to know how to make plans work as soon as a, a new building regulation comes out it's like oh my, you know how do we make this work and our designs not good. and window formats and stuff as well all that kind of stuff you know, it's a whole catalog of kit of parts that you've got to try and master and i think it's partly to do with you know, winning the battles you can win um, but also where you do, where do you load your creativity you know and i think architecture can evolve to do with these things and there still should be a con con conversation about architecture and space and delight and ambience and and we but we have to take this 
we have to deal with this thing and we have to make it work and, and ingrain it into our work so that we do have buildings that are environmentally sustainable. You know, I think that's really important. It's, it's just a given now. And, um, it's a bit like you can complain all you like about it, but um, as you say, if you if you if you teach yourself, well, that yourself that, that that building is totally naturally ventilated, except the kitchens and toilets, and it's got a EPC of A and a Briam of excellent, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, if you sent that elevation to a passive house person, they'd go, it's it's a pile of shite. It doesn't work. <laughs> So, well, we're going on too long. <laughs> well, you've, you've owned the can, you know, and the, the can is embodied carbon, steel, all these things. It's all of it, yeah. Yeah, all that all stuff. I you know, just have to get aware of it. And, you know, Chris is like banging the drum and has led a good charge. I went, went to CPD with you, Chris, a few years ago, and we had a conversation. That, you know, it, left yeah. a, it struck a chord, you know. And, and I'm a passive house designer, by the way. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I know the kind of points that you're making. And yeah. I know the point you're making about uh, procurement because there's some big changes happening in procurement and I think everybody's waking up to those outcomes first yeah. is so important. What is the building at the end of the process that everybody gets and it's, it's not necessarily the same that the clients want yeah. and it's not necessarily the same that contractors want to build so there's really going to be a strong focus back on quality I think and yeah. you can feel that brewing at yeah. the moment. Yeah. Things that will last a long, long, long time. And uh, long life was very yeah. 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 Exactly. Passive house, yeah, no, I, I, I'm a bit of a convert, I must admit. Um, I actually see that as quite a good passive house elevation. <laughs> <laughs> to tell you the truth, I can see the small windows over there and I can see the overhangs of the sun out here and there, but I think it's quite good. Yeah. Thank you. Another design, another design constraint, you know, is just making sure that we take it on board and we use it so that we can make better buildings. Exactly. Um, and, I mean, we're, we're having to teach to the school now. We're, we're, I mean, it's great. We're, we're having real conversations about what is capable of being done and how do you still bring artistry to that as well and creativity. And that's the, that, for me, is this, the thing you can't lose sight of. You know, and then when you're together in a forum like this, it's to try and encourage each other that it's not, you know, it's not out of control. The things that are within our control, we can do good things still. Um, and I think that's what our kind of talk was about. I think... You know, there's a bit of positivity really, it's a bit of optimism. I think we have to be optimistic, you know, otherwise you might as well go and grow some vegetables in a garden somewhere. You know. I'm not working at it. You know, trade to the West. You know. East and I know what to tell you. I have one question. So I'll be moving on from that subject a little bit. Um, you have quite a lot of timber cladding use in your projects, which looks lovely when it's obviously first built. Uh, when it age, obviously it has ma maintenance issues and obviously schools are probably aiming to kind of low maintenance materials in general. How did you manage to get around it and did you revisit the schools after many years and how the maintenance works on, on, on that? Like what's the strategy for it? I think, I think there's a number of things. I mean the, the visitor centres have got <coughs> timber on them because they're single storey buildings. The, the classification of the building allows you to do that. I think with Things like schools now it's starting to be, you know, class A, mm -hmm. external laws class A for insurance purposes. So it's becoming more and more difficult to mm -hmm. specify timber on these buildings. Um, so it's it's to do with you know multiple levels, story heights, all that kind of thing as well. So it's, it's but I think the other thing about timber is, I mean, Henry and I go way back and sorry Henry, and we built a, we built a building at Glasgow Green, a little a little building, and we built it out of timber because at that time you could build. The external wall out of timber and it, it went kind of quite black yeah. and it's been black since about the first or second year mm -hmm. and it wasn't deliberate you know it was just that you know we had seen chipperfields building in henley and we thought wouldn't it be nice to use some timber but we didn't, we didn't realize that probably in henley there's less particulates per square meter than there is in the east end of glasgow mm -hmm. ergo you have a problem you know so the thing the situation hasn't failed but i think it taught us a valuable lesson that there was two things one was that the location is vital, so if you're in a non-urban situation, you get much more, I think, and if you're working with a house rather than a school or a public building, it opens up all these different things. So I think it's like not thinking about a design solution too early in the process, you know, before you understand what you're dealing with, mm. you know? But I, I mean, the fundamental thing is, in this climate, yeah, the fundamental thing we've learned because of we've made mistakes. Especially if 
is, like is if you do if you go to yeast timber and it'll be it'll be yeah. it'll be it should be used where it'll get the most relief from direct rain and no sun. Because yeah. sometimes you can see the projects yeah. that maybe have a yeah. little bit so overhang and then yeah. the yeah. part of it is it's not. It's and then you have obviously those yeah. patches, colours. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's all to do with so orientation. Uh -huh. You know, if you're in a north, east, north, north elevation, timber will never ever silver. Mm -hmm. It'll blacken. Yeah. Period. In this country. It's yeah. Lovely on the right. other facades, it yeah. will depending on kind of Sand, exposure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know. It's just I've seen quite, a, you know, quite a lot of projects that I've been showing at the beginning. They yeah. had that timber part and, and you know, uh, it looked amazing. It's just I wondered how that actually aged and did that look decent well, after <coughs> many I mean years? Or you know, on the bossy, for instance, that's charred. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's right, pre-charred. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. mm -hmm. So that's done before it comes on site. The actual turret itself is stained. Mm -hmm. Ah, you know, okay. It's a wee bit of a cheat, really, you know, mm -hmm. um, because we couldn't get timber that size charred, I think, mm -hmm. you know, without running around with a blowtorch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the actual cladding is, is charred yeah. on it, so the thin members are charred. So I think it was just, I think also as well, like Henry's, like Henry's talking about, you know, we were uncertain, even though it was in a woodland, that, that there wouldn't be particulates that would, you know, leave the timber not looking good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then it was also that I was a design idea behind it as well, which is about recession, which is about making a shadow. You know, and I know everyone you can buy a, you can buy books now which says black timber buildings and all that, or the art of the black, and you get this tens and hundreds of books that's full of wee black buildings. But I think you know, putting all cynicism aside, I think there's good practical reasons for sometimes making things black because they do recede. I think also when your budget's limited, it's mm -hmm. a bit like if you go to Marks and Spencers and buy a black polo neck, no one knows it's from Marks and Spencers mm -hmm. when you put it on. You know what I'm saying? There's certain yeah. things that if they're coloured a certain way, don't, yeah. look, don't look as nice. cost effective <laughs> as they might otherwise look. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a kind of, I think architects have to choose their materials carefully so that you don't have, you get longevity, but you also choose wisely in terms of aesthetics as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you think you're okay with it going dark and black over time, because that's part of your intent, which yeah. is also the other thing as well. So it's not always an instantly brown and or yellow or whatever. Mm -hmm. you might know, yeah. have to accept the change of the building over time. It's part of exactly. Yeah, I was wondering, because you're talking about um, education buildings, uh, do you, what's the collaborative process that you go through with the teachers and children in the buildings? Do you have a lot of community engagement to kind of process and flush that out? The process is led by that. Mm -hmm. Before you've even drawn up a scheme, the process is led by that. Um, sometimes we work with partners who do the engagement, or sometimes we do it ourselves. You're, you're basically speaking to everyone. You know, from children. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. children. You know, exactly. it takes about, yeah. well, it's quite a long time. Yeah. Yeah. It could be easily a year and a half yeah. of consultation, of, through all the different layers of consultation before you get someone to go, yeah, that adjacency is right, or, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that includes parents, kids, government, funders, Teachers, head teachers. Different councils are different, different yeah. as well, and how they approach it. It's Some it's will want you to lead you down that path yeah, as to what they want. In, it's fairly intense. Yeah. And, but, but, and by the time you get the end of it, it's like you try, you try to close it down and go, can someone just go, that's a classroom, that's a. So, the, it, 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 so you have to get yourself ready for that if you're going to school. Mm -hmm. <coughs> that you're in, in there for the long haul. And there's an awful lot of people who have got an awful lot to say about everything in the building. Yeah, I, I mean, can you know, we're, we're not working. We're, Russell, you'll know as well. We're working in schools where you're going to have the police, the dentists, mm -hmm. uh, the public who come in and go and swim, mm -hmm. doctors. So before you know it, you've not got another, you know, multi-layer of different people who are of. What am I going to get? How should I? room going to be safe if two blogs walk, you know, and mm -hmm. how's my wee five-year-old going to be safe if this guy comes in to go swimming and has other things on their mind, you know, it's, so you've got to get yourself ready for that, and I think there are good people who can do it well, mm -hmm. I don't think architects do it brilliantly, unassisted, 
because I think you need people who can go right. We need to know how to talk to people, you know, how to communicate with them, understand what they're saying, and then return that into a reflection that allows you to be able to make decisions. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I, think I don't know, yeah. Russell, what you think. I, I, I think, you think? I think yeah, all our stuff, all the stuff, even the stuff in the passive house stuff, and, and all the different constraints we have, including dealing with the public. It's not generally teachers, and it's not generally pupils that are the issue. It's generally the public. It's the guy that's got a house that looks over that. Yeah. Doesn't well, see it. Yeah, and yeah, everybody <laughs> thinks there's a, a bigger agenda than you're part of the, 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 the government that's dealing with us. So that's that thing. But I think most of the stuff is just being reactive to these things and, and keeping, keeping moving an agile way to get to the end point that still is something you want to give but actually the secret's giving them something that they think they, they asked for. Yeah. I want to make a consultation <laughs> that, that's the, I want to that's a the open. You want, Russell, I went to a consultation in the open many, many years ago and there must have been about five hundred people in the room. And I was had to do the presentation and I, I started opening my mouth and they went they went, We can't hear you. Can you move down the room a bit? Uh, all right, so I moved down and started again. We still can't hear you. So they put me on a table in the middle of the room. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Are we done? I kid you not. This is a huge story. I kid you not. So I'm standing on this table in the middle of, yeah, of this fractious crowd, and it was probably the most traumatic life of my whole life. <laughs> a night of my, it was absolutely horrendous because it's nothing to do with the building. Yeah. It's just to do with Politics. people wanting their opinion yeah. expressed. Anyway, th 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 <laughs> that was a howler. I remember driving home down to Glasgow again going, what the hell? What? <laughs> 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 it, yeah. it was a trauma. <laughs> You're still recovering, Henry. <laughs> what was that? Yeah, <laughs> Can't walk by a table without shivering. <laughs> <laughs> In the middle, yeah. stand you up. Maybe I should play one as well. Can I make you? I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> Any other points in the discussion? No? Great. Well, just very quick thank you on behalf of GIA for coming. It's a really good talk. Um, I you covered architectural principles, but also the moral principles and the integrity, which obviously comes through in your work. And it's been brilliant watching it going from Hillhead through to where you are now. Um, I think Hillhead Primary School, I used to drive past it every day, and that was the first building of yours that I thought I saw, and I just thought it was brilliant the way it's just a, a walkover thing as part mm -hmm. of the, as part of the, the area. Um, and it was quite nice when it was an Indian and then it was rubbish when it was a car park because the hooligans <laughs> used to push cars down the slope onto the cars at the bottom so, but, it's, but it's working well uh, one of the things that came out of the judges' visits was that uh, someone who's a very strong competitor of yours said the thing he likes is that your buildings are not designed to be photographed they're designed to be experienced and that really came through when he was doing his, doing his visit so I thought that was a, a good compliment so anyway, thank you again that was a super talk <laughs>